Well, I want to begin uh, by thanking all of you um, for being here. There are actually lots of really extraordinary events today, many of which I wish I could double, triple myself to attend. Um, and I really appreciate the chance to talk to you about um, the questions that Denise laid out. Before I start, I want to begin by thanking Denise Walsh, Nick Winter, Alexis Miller, and the Power, Violence, and Inequality Initiative for the invitation to speak. I also want to thank Dan Henry, who may not remember, but he did some of the research um, that went into uh, my comments today. The original impetus for the talk was the appalling celebration of white supremacy on this campus and in downtown, downtown Charlottesville. And as I thought about what I might say, my initial reaction was that I would offer an overview of the movement for black reparations and then speak to the critical ways that the language of repair can contribute to Americans' ongoing and anguished debates about the living legacies of slavery segregation, and the grip of identity-based violence and hatred. As I considered further, I realized that over the past few years, one of the books I've returned to again and again um, is, is a book whose wisdom acquires new urgency with each fresh case of racial injustice, with each outrage against democracy. Published 50 years ago, Martin Luther King's Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community, makes a powerful argument on behalf of reparations for slavery and Jim Crow, but it also helps us to see why the events of August 11th and 12th, while important additions to the ledger, should not overshadow the longer history of white supremacy and the practices, both spectacular and quotidian, that have undermined the realization of democratic ideals in a nation founded on slavery and indigenous dispossession. So this afternoon, I'd like to talk about how King helps us to imagine the present day realities of racial injustice, to reckon, um, to reckon with the history um, that so many of us misrepresent with astonishing glibness, and to demand concrete forms of redress before it's too late. Now, many of you should have a handout. Um, if you don't, I encourage you to find somebody who does and to sit next to him or her. Um, this is the 20th century version of the PowerPoint slide. Um, and this is just a series of quotations. And I'll, I'll let you know when I'm coming to one of the, the quotations um, to discuss. So I'm going to begin with the first quotation on the handout. Whether we realize it or not, each of us lives eternally in the red. We are everlasting debtors to unknown men and women. We are indebted, King contends, to the labor and the ingenuity of people around the world and to the work of generations that's bound together in an economy that is moral as well as commercial. King's claim is familiar to anyone who has spent time with his words or followed his political example. The entanglement of every nation and each individual life with every other is a keystone of his thinking from the period of the Montgomery movement in the 1950s until his death in 1968. If there's nothing surprising about King's uh, intimation that such connectedness spans historical eras as well as national boundaries, however, I think his formulation does more than simply reaffirm human beings' mutual interdependence. It joins an understanding of justice to a philosophy of history in which today's generation is doubly in indebted to generations past and yet to come. King's account of what it means to be in the red is also doubled in the second sense. Even as he insists on the universalism of our indebtedness, thereby drawing all of his readers into a shared sphere of responsibility, he makes particular note of the debts unpaid for what Lincoln called the wealth piled by the bondsman's 250 years of unrequited toil, and for the century of exploitation and violent suppression that followed the Civil War. Looking back at this bloody history, King departs from Lincoln when he concludes, and I quote, the practical cost of change for the nation up to this point has been cheap. Looking ahead, he urges his readers to reckon with their unpaid bills domestic and global, or risk losing everything they value. Although King rejects any politics narrowly based on interest, financial metaphors and critiques of unjust economic arrangements pervade his political writings. 
Perhaps the most famous example is the 1963 March on Washington, um, in which King's I Have a Dream speech spoke of cashing a check and demanding the fulfillment of a promissory note embedded in, embodied in the Declaration of Independence. Economic language, if less pronounced, also merges in his earlier work. In Stride Toward Freedom, the Montgomery story, for example, King decries what he calls an essentially unreconstructed economy, one that has preserved the exploitation of African Americans from the time of abolition to King's own time. And it persists through his posthumously published Testament of Hope, where King prophesies that, quote, justice so long deferred has accumulated interest and its cost for this society will be substantial in financial as well as human terms. Critically, King departs from a pure economic logic insofar as he insists on the distinction between just and unjust transactions. Unjust transactions, he observes, include the expectation that African Americans must pay for their rights. He notes that US democracy has been marked by an illegitimate demand for payment from the slave era when men and women were forced to purchase their own freedom, through the 20th century expectation that civil rights would be purchased out of what he calls the funds of passivity and patience. When he writes that democracy in its finest sense is payment, King draws on the language of money and debt not to reinforce conventional understandings of politics as a game of competing interests, but to make vivid the history of United States unmet obligations. In this light, it's unsurprising that his political thought has been enlisted on behalf of arguments for reparations for past and ongoing crimes. As Alfred Brophy notes, Why We Can't Wait, which is King's book that came out, uh, first appeared in 1963, has been an important source for reparations advocates because King connects the crimes of slavery to a demand for compensatory treatment and to a Bill of Rights for the disadvantaged. And ta Coates draws on film footage to suggest that King advanced an explicit argument for reparations toward the end of his life. Now, I think there is little evidence to suggest that King would embrace Coates' more extravagant remark that, quote, reparations is not one possible tool in the against white supremacy. It is the indispensable tool against white supremacy. But his choice of words, that is King's choice of words, lends robust support to contemporary arguments for black reparations. And here I want to look at the second quotation. This comes from Why We Can't Wait. Few people consider the fact that in addition to being enslaved for two centuries, the Negro was during all those years robbed of the wages of his toil no amount of gold could provide an adequate compensation for the exploitation and humiliation of the Negro in America down through the centuries. Not all the wealth of this affluent society could meet the bill. Yet a price can be pace, placed on unpaid wages. The ancient common law has always provided a remedy for the appropriation of the labor of one human being by another. This law should be made to apply for American Negroes. The payment should be in the form of a massive program by the government of special compensatory measures, which could be regarded as a settlement in accordance with the accepted promise of common law. Such measures would certainly be less expensive than any compensation based on two centuries of unpaid wages and accumulated interest. Now, although the statement looks backward to the crimes of two centuries and is framed as a matter of compensation, King also extends the argument outward beyond a narrow calculation of what is due. Not only does he forgo the accounting of the full worth of unpaid wages and interest on the debt, which he, you know, is, he, he, he notes is not payable. It exceeds the imagination what is owed um, for those crimes. But he also advocates a Bill of Rights for the disadvantaged that controversially, controversially included um, what he called the forgotten white poor. These are women and men he sees as collateral victims of an economy predicated on the exploitation of black labor for white profits. And part of what's distinctive about this move is it refuses any choice between addressing the specific historical claims of black Americans on the one hand and the universal fight against poverty on the other. This is not a class versus race argument. This is an argument 
that addressing race is one way to come to terms with the challenges of structural inequality, class-based structural inequality. Together, King's recurrent use of the language of debt and payment and his alignment of those concepts with a love-driven universalism troubles the categories that have structured so many debates about historic injustice. Even as he returns repeatedly to the question of what is owed to black Americans, he refuses any narrow conception of the debt. Even as he develops a devastating critique of the profits that white Americans have reaped through the exploitation of black labor, even as he, maintains, um, even as he identifies post-Civil War labor conditions as a new form of slavery, and even as he maintains that whites are psychologically unprepared for genuine racial equality, King trains his focus on the broad structural harms of white supremacy and eschews any simple schemes for wealth transfer. In this sense, I think Preston Williams rightly observes that King's conception of justice means that his allies are, quote, not to press unduly their rightful claim for reparations. It's an interesting claim. And I want to suggest that King negotiates this line between a refusal to act unduly and a conviction that reparations claims are rightful. And I want to do so through a reading of Where Do We Go From Here, the last of King's three political autobiographies, and the last of the, of the autobiographies published during his lifetime. To read Where Do We Go From Here as an autobiography is to situate it within a longer history of African-American literary self-making. The book's form enables this master of the sermon, the public address, and the open letter to lay out his moral and political priorities in greater depth through the recounting of moments from his own life. Yet King's book also stretches the boundaries of autobiography insofar as it does not offer a conventional birth to the present narrative and gives us very little in the way of personal information. Like the successive autobiographies composed by W.E.B. Du Bois, it's usefully read as what Robert Gooding Williams calls a political allegory, a way of narrating the story of the struggle, um, the struggle for black freedom, as an exemplary case through which to reflect on the ideal of emancipation in both the US and around the world. Appearing in 1967, Where Do We Go From Here was the product of King's most difficult year when he moved his family to Chicago and attempted to refocus national attention from the evil so theatrically displayed by Southern bullies like Bull Connor, Jim Clark, and George Wallace to the less visible poison of Northern segregation and the forms of violence affected by poverty and public disregard. Its publication also followed the uprising in Watts, the obvious failure of legislative victories to affect change on the ground, the escalation of the war in Vietnam, and King's lonely decision to take a public stand in opposition to that war. Although carefully tuned to the political frequencies of his time, King's text is illuminating insofar as it reimagines but doesn't abandon key commitments that shaped his thought from the 1950s forward. While the themes are familiar, however, I think the argument makes some crucial pivots from some of his early and possibly more familiar claims. And so in the remainder of the talk, what I want to do is to look at the ways in which King interprets his present, that is, what does the present look like in 1967, 50 years ago, and how can looking at that moment 50 years ago help us to think about our own present, um, how he narrates the past, and how he envisions the future. So I consider his, King's answer to his own question, where are we, by presenting the civil rights movement's most celebrated victories as a moment of loss, confronted by the stunning disconnection between legislative accomplishment and the immiseration of black communities. King attempts to come to terms with what that disconnection reveals about white opposition to racial equality. His response to the challenges of black power and to the urban uprisings indicate that a full analysis of the present requires reckoning with the cumulative effects of the exploitation and devaluation of black life and the unmet material needs of all people. Second, I ask how King's retelling of US history decenters the Declaration and the Constitution 
both key texts, especially in his earlier, um, some of his earlier speeches, to highlight the economic roots of slavery and trace its effects. King discloses missed opportunities. Um, King's, uh, the story he tells serves three ends. It discloses missed opportunities for establishing a genuinely democratic society. It provides an explanation for inequalities that structure King's own period. And it lays the ground for demands for concrete forms of redress in the future. Finally, I say a little bit about King's vision of the future. Uh, the interpenetration of present and future is a recurrent feature of his thought. From his earliest critiques of the myth of time through his repeated insistence that tomorrow is today. But when he reiterates those claims from the vantage of 1967, he has to contend with a breakdown in his own earlier confidence that it was possible to transform the consciousness of most white Americans and his growing apprehension about US military destruction around the world. Thus, I think where do we go from here leaves us with a paradox. King's emphasis on the cumulative debts of past and present injustices um, shows us why it is that we must act now concretely and massively to invest in those communities that bear the brunt of slavery's unpaid debts. But he also asks us in this text to reckon with the possibility that it is already too late. That by our procrastination, and the we here I think is his audience both in 1967 and his readers today, are failing to fulfill our obligations to future generations whose inheritance is in our hands. So where are we? Strikingly, where do we go from here begins as an account of loss. This is striking because the book actually opens in the president's room of the US Capitol, August 6, 1965, at the very moment that Lyndon Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act in front of an interracial audience. As King notes, and here I quote, the legislation was designed to put the ballot effectively into Negro hands in the South after a century of denial by terror and evasion. Where the reader might expect King to pause here in acknowledgment of a triumph to which he had contributed, he moves briskly past the signing to contemplate its context. He notes that the civil rights movement failed to bridge a fundamental chasm between black and white objectives. For the vast majority of Americans, the past decade, he writes, had been a struggle to treat the Negro with a degree of decency, not of equality. Long a fierce critic of white moderates and the thinness of American goodwill, King reiterates his concerns about the fatal conjunction of white sincerity with what he calls a, van a fantasy of self-deception and comfortable vanity. He presses the analysis further, disclosing the degree to which white sincerity might in fact be an obstacle to progress. The upshot is a legal revolution that masks the reality that the changes already realized have been cheaply bought and that undoing the work of white supremacy will require sacrifices on a scale not yet imagined. In fact, King argues, white and black Americans do not even share a common language for equality. The passage of the legislation of the 60s discloses that white Americans, by and large, while deeply troubled by the overt brutality of Jim Crow, were engaged in a form of counter-revolution. When King contends that, quote, white America is not even psychologically ready to close the gap, essentially it seeks only to make it less painful and less obvious, but in most respects to retain it. He contrasts the righteousness of black demands against the obduracy of what Darren Hutchinson calls racial exhaustion. Hutchinson's phrase captures the dominant temporal perspective against which King battles in which even modest measures of progress are met with white insistence that enough or too much has been done on behalf of African Americans, and that it's past time to move on from questions of racial injustice. And King goes further. He notes that celebrations of the progress of the civil rights movement obscure the degree to which Americans moved backwards during that period, even as they locked arms singing, we shall overcome. When the Constitution was written, King writes, a strange formula to determine taxes and representation declared that the Negro was 60% of a person. Today, another curious formula, 
seems to declare that he is 50% of a person. This shift is systemic, King explains, showing how black Americans enjoyed 50% of the benefits, most benefits of life in the US, and were at least twice as likely to be subject to such harms as poor schools, high infant mortality, combat deaths, unemployment, and more. The statistics are neither accidental nor indicative of innate inferiority, but they are the products of an economic system predicated on cheap labor and a culture of denial. And although King accounts for significant progress, especially in the changes to the laws uh, in the Jim Crow South, he also notes how the backward march is both abetted and disavow disavowed by Americans who continue to call for African Americans to wait for justice. The failed implementation of Brown v. Board and a range of civil rights laws intimates, quote, that legal structures have in practice proved to be neither structures nor law. Challenging liberal tendencies to conceive of integration in aesthetic terms, King recasts his longstanding critique of tokenism in a way that anticipates the diversity agendas of today's institutions, including institutions of higher education. His famous emphasis on the fierce urgency of now, in other words, resets a balance sheet that has overvalued American democratic accomplishments and failed to reckon with the effects of American crimes. To offer an alternative to stillborn legislative measures and white intransigence, he turns our attention to the significance of one of the greatest challenges to his own leadership at the time, the emergence of black power. Indeed, he enlists the idea of black power, even as he criticizes it as a cry of disappointment. For that cry is rightfully animated by complaint. It reflects the unpunished murders of civil rights workers, the devaluation of black life, the timidity of the federal government in enforcing its own mandates, rampant discrimination and segregation in the North, and the gap between the praise for black nonviolence on the one hand and US militarism on the other. We might think how far we have come from King's moment in any one of these respects. He thus allows that the diagnosis offered by Stokely, Stokely Carmichael and other young activists is on the mark no matter how much he refuses their proposed cure. And far from being racism in reverse, he contends that the call for black power reflects a belief that racial separation is the only plausible response to a nation in the grip of white power. Where any advocacy of violence represents a destructive reproduction of the past in King's view, he discerns in the cry of disappointment an acute assessment of the ongoing workings of the past in the present. Writing against the progressive trajectories of American public discourse and history, he understands that the past is not past. The frustrations that give rise to black power reflect injuries that perdure. They represent a process of what Ian Haney Lopez calls cumulation. And here I quote, in the double sense of something that is both aggregative and combinative, heaping up advantage and disadvantage and thereby creating dynamics that transcend the sum of the parts. King's approach to realizing the challenge of justice in his time, which acknowledges the layered features of time itself, resonates with Iris Marion Young's social connection model of political responsibility. The debts that have accrued over the centuries don't only demand an accounting of liability in a legal sense. Just as crucially, they call upon all citizens to take action. Coming to terms with the plural temporalities of responsibility for structural injustice demands an investigation of the ways in which such injustice has been sedimented. And it's precisely this analysis that King perceives his fellow white citizens evading in an unwillingness to translate legal and legislative change into substantive change. Despite his concern about the lack of a common language, a shared understanding even of the meaning of equality, King nonetheless persists in modeling key features of what Young calls political responsibility in his own work. And here's how she describes it. In joining one another to reorganize collective relationships, debating with one another about how to accomplish such reorganization, and holding one another to account for what we are doing and not doing to undermine structural injustice. 
Now, King departs from Young in one critical respect, where she rejects what she calls the language of debt, blame, or liability as anti-political. King retains the concept of the debt with its distinctive merging of the temporal and the material. But he does so without ressentiment, without the corrosive aspiration to get even. When he argues, and here I quote, that a society that has done something special against the Negro for hundreds of years must now do something special for him, he advances a conception of special redress in terms that are simultaneously particular and universal, corrective and distributive, backward and forward looking. So let's think about the unfinished business of the past. King's argument depends on a restaging of American history, an imprint of other African American political thinkers, especially Du Bois, comes to the fore in the historical narrative that King lays out in Where Do We Go From Here? In King's Carnegie Hall tribute to Du Bois, delivered shortly before his own assassination, he singles out Du Bois' work as a historian, as his signal contribution, and avers that white Americans owe Du Bois a debt for cutting through the fog of ignorance that has obscured a truthful telling of US history, and for teaching us something about what King calls our tasks of emancipation. Likewise, King's chapter on what he calls racism and the white backlash begins with an assertion that, quote, it is time for all of us to tell each other the truth about who and what have brought the Negro to the condition of depredation, deprivation against which he struggles today. A truthful examination of that history, King writes, exposes missed opportunities, offers an explanation for present day conditions, and provides grounds for reparative policies. So King returns to history in many ways across his, his, um, his speeches and his books. Um, as I mentioned before, in the I Have a Dream speech, he talks about the promissory note that the nation has yet to fulfill. In Why We Can't Wait, he specifies that debt and we, um, in that long passage that I read. Um, and in Where Do We Go From Here, he makes another move. He investigates the relationship between the birth of democracy and the rise of slavery, and charts American subsequent failure to commit to the former by fully abolishing the latter. And I think this move is really important um, insofar as it squarely situates American democratic principles within a history of bondage and conquest. The bondage and the dispossession come first for King then you have the articulation of the values in the Declaration and the Constitution. So they provide the context. And this is a move, um, I think, that takes him away from earlier claims where he goes to what he calls the great wells of democracy as a shared rhetorical um, basis uh, through which he can talk um, across racial lines to broad audiences. And where do we go from here, particularly in the face of the failure of that talk in some senses? He rethinks the approach to US history um, in, important, in, in important respects. Um, so even as he again returns to what he calls the electrifying expression of the rights of man by Paine, by Jefferson and others, he also notes that the founders perpetuated what he calls the ghastly blood traffic and the wealth embodied in African slaves and in conquered land, in King's words, shaped the political, social, political, legal structure of the nation. So the idea that, that the political, so, social, political, legal structure of the nation is shaped by settler colonialism and racial slavery becomes crucial in this argument. Plus the opportunity to put democratic ideals into practice was eclipsed more than once by the economic allure of slavery and the profound role of racism, so that King writes, slavery was not only ignored in defining democracy, but its enlargement was tolerated in the interest of strengthening the nation. Adding to that, adding to that history is the physical extermination of the American Indian. It's also pivotal to that story. As the chapter unfolds, furthermore, King tackles the widespread misperception of the meaning of emancipation by retelling it as a story of abandonment. The contours of the story are familiar to any reader of Du Bois or Douglas or Ida B. Wells or other thinkers who have attempted to challenge the perception of a nation that believes 
that it freed the slaves and thereby settled the question of democracy. That this project of recovering the missed opportunities of the past is so vital to King's argument indicates the limited impact that those earlier reconstructions had on Americans' political, I'm sorry, historical imagination. And I think we need go no further than, than Pennsylvania Avenue to see the ways in which Americans are still um, struggling against uh, a very limited, constrained historical imagination. Indeed, King asks, what greater injustice could society perpetrate? And here I turn to the third quotation. In 1863, the Negro was given abstract freedom expressed in luminous rhetoric. But in an agrarian economy, he was given no land to make liberation concrete. After the war, the government granted white settlers without cost millions of acres in the West, thus providing America's new white peasants from Europe with an economic floor. But at the same time, the oldest peasantry, the Negro, was denied everything but a legal status he could not use, could not consolidate, could not even defend. As Frederick Douglass came to say, emancipation granted the Negro freedom to hunger, freedom to winter amidst the rains of heaven. Emancipation was freedom and famine at the same time. Now, the implication of King's claim is stunning. He is effectively saying that what followed the Civil War was morally worse than the crimes that precipitated it. Offering abstract freedom without any concrete commitment to its realization, King argues, was itself a crime. And here I quote, well, the, oh, sorry, actually, this, um, while the formerly enslaved navigated between travestied emancipation and an illusory freedom, those are Sadia Hartman's words, white ambivalence in the face of white violence flourished and the evasion of legal mandates persisted from the post-Civil War period through the era of civil rights. Where do we go from here thus troubles a key element of King's earlier speeches? His aspiration to radically reinterpret the American dream by representing white leaders whom he names as fellow extremists in the cause of love and justice. When he scrutinizes white unwillingness to embrace racial equality in 1967, King recalls Thomas Jefferson's legacy as the, author of the, as the author of the claim that all men are created equal in light of his commitment as a racial scientist. Similarly, King supplements his earlier praise for Lincoln's extremism in the anti-slavery cause with a reflection on a man, quote, whose torments and vacillations were notorious, sorry, were tenacious. By situating these men within the history of what they did to participate in, condone, or extend the life of racial slavery, he lays bare the danger of a common rhetorical gesture one familiar to many of us um, at UVA in particular, whereby the word but acknowledges the hero's weakness and insulates his greatness from critique. Like Du Bois before him, he recasts official stories of democratic greatness to reveal a fatal spirit of temporizing that has characterized white Americans' approach to questions of racial justice from the founding era forward. A second feature of his retelling of this history is its explanatory power. To counter the idea that racial inequality can be accounted for by racial difference, he traces the lineage and effects of what he calls the white man's problem. He identifies the economic roots of slavery and tracks how, quote, the doctrine of white supremacy was embedded in every textbook and preached in practically every pulpit. It became a structural part of the culture. One of the striking features of this argument is King's emphasis on the ways in which black communities have been damaged. While where do, where do we go from here makes note of the longstanding work of black women and men against impossible odds and characterizes their activities as revolutionary, King also employs some of the most troubling tropes of the social scientists and policymakers of his day. As many commentators have noted, his depiction of the injuries inflicted by the polity also evinces a deep gender conservatism. Chief among the stunting effects of slavery and of generations of exploitation, he notes, is what he calls family disorganization, 
and in passages that appear uncomfortably close to Daniel Patrick Moynihan's notorious report on the Negro family. He decries the rise of a matriarchy under slavery and identifies it as a precursor to the, quote, fragile, deprived, and often psychopathic black family in his own time. So here, King's language poses a challenge for 21st century interpreters. On the one hand, his equation of patriarchal families and male breadwinning with cultural well-being suggests that the somebodiness that he celebrates involves the subordination of black women. On the other hand, he attributes these features of black life to an unjust economic system and to the pathologies of white culture in ways that I think can be used to support democratic arguments today. Taken together, the account of missed opportunities and of the damage done by centuries of racial oppression provide a platform from which he offers specific po policies to counter the legacies of racial slavery, of that history. The policies he advocates are redistributed, redistributive, but their force derives from an account of both the duty to, affect, uh, to correct the effects of historic injustice and the duty to assure that every member of a society has the wherewithal to live a dignified life. No society, King declares, can fully repress an ugly past when the ravages persist into the present. America owes a debt of justice, which is, it has only begun to pay. It owes that debt to the enslaved workers who created American wealth, to the black Americans of King's time who are confined to unlivable neighborhoods, and to all people who are direct and indirect vi victims of white supremacy. At the heart of King's scheme for repayment is the abolition of poverty through a guaranteed livable income. King's adamant that his aspiration is universal. After all, he explains, and where do we go from here, the primary beneficiaries of such a program would be poor whites, because at the time they outnumbered their black counterparts by a two to one ratio. Real freedom, King requi argues, requires not only guaranteed income, but also investment in education, in housing, in employment, and a radically expanded conception of rights. Now here again, I think, at first glance, this argument appears to suggest that universal solutions are preferable to reparations or to other race-conscious policies um, that counter a history of anti-black um, racism. But King's appeal to the idea of abolition is not incidental. Explicitly or not, his language aligns him with a tradition of race-conscious radical Democrats like Du Bois before him and Angela Davis more recently, whose conception of abolition democracy draws upon the lost promise of reconstruction to reveal the role of capitalism in entrenching the power of white supremacy. It also resonates with many 20, 21st century proponents of reparations for whom, um, and here I quote from Sal Salome Shatilat, the past is a signifier for the yet to be seen possibilities and potential of American democracy. To be effective furthermore, King's imagination doesn't stop there. These policies must be part of a global program. For the history he retells is also one of colonial arrogance and neo-colonial power. And he also envisions what he calls a massive sustained Marshall Plan for Asia, Africa, and South America. So, where do we go? What does King's vision reveal about the tasks of imagination today? One of the things that I think is striking about where do we go from here is that the urgency of that text is different, I think, in important ways from the urgency of his earlier writings. And I think those differences may explain why it has such power to speak to the challenges of our present moment. In effect, I think the conclusion of where do we go from here reveals the possibility of a post-American king, one who is inspired by revolutionary accomplishments of the colonized, although not blind to the crimes committed by post-colonial governments, and who sees the US of his time as a world leader in its destructive belligerence. King's text is palpably haunted by a future in which generations of dreams and sacrifice could come to nothing, or worse, 
His contemplation of the forward thrust of time yields one of the most chilling lines of his entire corpus. And this is the final quotation. Over the bleached bones and jumbled residues of numerous civilizations are written the pathetic words, too late. The book testifies to the extent of the wreckage already piled up, and where King once observed the time as neutral, available for constructive or destructive purposes, where do we go from here refigures it as, quote, deaf to every plea, it rushes on. So reading King, and particularly this text in the 21st century, is disturbing. It ought to be disturbing. Have we learned, I think he forces us to ask, have we learned to live with the chaos that he intimates will come from his contemporaries' disregard for the children, women, and men trapped in poverty with few services or any reliable means of security or exit? What is the distance between the grim realities he delineates and the hostility black citizens encounter both from the state and from their fellow citizens when they dare to proclaim that black lives matter? King's account of the debts not yet paid in 1967 does not touch on the costs of mass incarceration or on the mounting tolls of American persistence in quote, talking peace while preparing for war or the price that the consumption habits of the wealthy exact from the people most vulnerable to global climate change. How has the ledger been reset over the 50 years since King's writing? Admittedly, if we look to King, his theological commitments would disallow any conclusion that it is already too late to pay down these debts. His 1967 Christmas sermon on peace, for example, reaffirms the ultimate morality of the universe and circles back to an invocation of the dream after narrating his encounter with the American nightmare. And it would be a gross distortion to deny King's insistence on the necessity of hope in what he saw as a God-created world. Still, the anguish that animates the book's last paragraph recasts King's relationship to time. Moving ahead while looking back, he addresses the reader not as Moses, leading his people out of the wilderness, but is one of those people, quote, standing bare, naked, and dejected with a lost opportunity. Where do we go from here registers the personal effects of the losses incurred in his own time and the crimes committed in his name as an American citizen. The challenge that this accounting poses to us today is its insistence that we confront the myriad ways in which we are too late already and yet take that belatedness not as a reason for despair, but as a spur to action, in King's words, to love. By calling us backward to a deep and careful examination of US history and forward to an appreciation for our mounting debts to future generations, King pleads with his readers to alchemize tragedy into justice. He asks us to take seriously the demands of reparations activists since the slave era have made for meaningful democratic reconstruction. And he warns that the price of continued intransigence and passivity is beyond calculation. After all, the same beloved thinker and activist whose final speech assured his audience that he had seen the promised land had also, and just as clearly, glimpsed its alternative.